Hey y'all, it's Tammy with Real Southern Woman. We're going to be reading in Hebrews tonight. We are continuing last night's subject. And um, Lord of mercy, this is such a deep subject, y'all. We could talk on it for quite some time. Um, because it just continually continues to explain it as you continue to read Hebrew. So it starts at about chapter 6, but it goes on and on and on. So um, I read the rest of chapter 7, and I read chapter 8. Then I went on Blue Letter Bible, and I looked at a couple of commentaries. Um, and one was Matthew Henry, which I like to read, and one was Charles Spurgeon, which I like to read. Um, if you are pretty, you know, familiar with the Bible and you are somebody that's looking more for meat than milk, and if you are, you know what I'm talking about, then you should read Charles Spurgeon's uh, Words of Wisdom. He has a morning and a night uh, word of wisdom. Well, I'm calling it Words of Wisdom, but it's his commentary, and it's on blueletterbible.com. So if you're interested in really getting deep into some information, then you should read it. I'm going to kind of start out tonight a little bit more generic and then get into the meat as we continue to talk. And what's so strange about this subject, I believe even when we were reading the other night, he actually starts in telling us that, you know, as Christians, it's time that we could excuse me, uh, digest some of this meat and not just milk. And so this whole portion in Hebrews is a deeper meaning and more uh, background on doctrine, uh, which is very interesting. And even if you're not a real, um, even if you're not real educated in the Word of God, um, it's still such an interesting subject, and it's pretty easy to follow. So I'm, I'm going to start tonight and try to start out with some generic stuff. Just for those of you who are new Christians, or you've been a Christian for a long time, and you just haven't been in your Bible, because it takes a minute to get back into sync to understanding some of these things. And I don't want to talk to you the way that they talk to us, you know, like we're some type of scholar or someone who's studying the Bible. Um, May at Mercer gets to, she could have picked to read books about famous books in history or literature, or she could choose to study the Bible, and she chose the Bible studies or religions, not just, I don't think it'll just be about the Bible, but she's going to study religion. So this, uh, I got her text today, and it had her schedule, and she is going to be taking, oh, oh, my phone's on the stand. I'm crazy. She's going to be taking um, Old Testament this semester, and I believe she will be taking at least four courses. So I would imagine she'll do Old Testament and New Testament, and I'm not sure what else she'll get to do, but... Um, I'm wondering what I shall learn. And May has a very, very good vocabulary and a very, very good um, memory like her daddy. Me and Amy are people that have to apply, apply, apply. So we don't remember everything we read. But May's one of those that if she reads it and she's interested, she's going to remember it. So I think... Um, if she continues to want to be a doctor, and that's totally up to her, because I, I would really kind of rather her not, uh, personally. Um, but if she does, hopefully she can remember all that information, uh, because I know they have to remember a lot of stuff. But let's get started in our Bible study tonight. It is going to be in Hebrew. And, um, gosh, there's just so much good stuff in this, in this y'all that it's so hard for me to just start in one spot and end it. So I may have to continue this uh, because it is really, really good, okay? And one thing I wanted to do tonight, because in chapter 7 and 8, it's telling you how God had a priest 
hood in the Old Testament. And then it tells you how Christ is the new high priest. Now, it gives you all this information, but it's kind of hard to follow when you're not that familiar with what happened in the Old Testament. So if you'll continue to read um, in Hebrew, as you continue to read, um, they actually get into the part that explains what the Old Testament priesthood was like, okay? So that's where I want to start. For those of y'all who don't really understand how it worked, I would rather give you the background in the later chapters of how it worked in the Old Testament than for you to kind of just be thinking, oh, really, you know, you know, not really understanding. So, chapter 9 talks about an earthly sanctuary, okay? I'm sorry, y'all, but I'm having to clear my throat. Chapter 9 talks about an earthly sanctuary. This is the sanctuary from the Old Testament because um, once Jesus Christ dies and he sits at the right hand father, father right hand side of God, he is, it's actually a heavenly sanctuary, okay, that we, um, that our priest is at. But I want to describe to you this earthly sanctuary as it does in the Word. The Word does such a good job. It's not confusing. It's not, you know, hard to understand this part of the Bible. Um, so we're, lo we're looking in Hebrews chapter 9. Now, I have a uh, King James, but it is a new King James, okay? So it may be just a tad different than your King James, but not so much that you shouldn't be able to follow. But it says, Then indeed the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand. So y'all listen, this is about the tabernacle. And God asked them to build this tabernacle in this order. And everything had different places and different meanings. Um, and it says, now it doesn't get real. It's, this is not the part that describes how to build the tabernacle. So it doesn't get that in, you know, intense. But it says, for a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So as you entered into the tabernacle, the first part was called the sanctuary. And this was a lampstand, a table, the showbread. Okay? This, and then behind a second veil, okay, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer, the Ark of the Covenant, overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Now, I'm going to tell you kind of, for those of you who don't kind of understand where all this come from, back in the Old Testament, the first thing that it mentions as being in this Ark of the Covenant this was a very holy thing. And there were things back then that were actually had holy um, value and worth. In other words, a thing could actually hold some value and worth. Now, one of those things was the golden pot that had manna. Now, in the Old Testament, when, when God... Um, brought the, the children of Israel out of bondage from Egypt. They walked around in the wilderness, and they he provided food for them from the sky called manna. So this golden pot was what held the manna. It was in this holiest of holies. Aaron's rod that budded Aaron was Moses' brother, if I remember correctly, 
and if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, but I'm pretty sure. And he had a rod and staff, and one of the things that God used to show the people in Egypt that he was a real God was that rod, um, the, the rod and staff could bud or turn into things, okay? That was in this Holy of Holies. And then the tablets of the covenant. We all know that when Moses comes out of Egypt with his people, he goes up to Mount Sinai and he is given the Ten Commandments, which is the beginning of the law that God gives the people, his people, the Jews, the, the Israelites. Okay, so that kind of gives you a history, a small history lesson. Okay. So these important things, very important things, were in this Holy of Holies. And then above these things was a cherubim of glory, which a cherubim is um, a statue that looks like an, it, it's really an angel, but they're not angels like we think are angels here on the earth. They're not an angel like what we make pictures of and sculptures of are not really even an angel. A cherubim is an angel, okay? And he had wings, and he usually had wings, like four sets of wings. Okay, so the cherubim was over it, um, and then there was a mercy seat. Now, when the things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, y'all. He only went into the Holy of Holies once a year, okay? Not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So what happened was when he went in here to do an offering for the people, first he had to make an offering for his own sin and for the sin of those that didn't even ask for an offering, okay? So he had to make himself holy by doing this, is what it amounts to, okay? So he offered it for himself and for the people sin committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic. For the present time, in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscious, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Now, what they're trying to say is they were doing things. They were making sacrifices of animals. And it was these actions that they performed that was required for them to be able to be right with God and be forgiven of their sin. Okay. Now, in Hebrew, it talks about how this old priesthood will go away, and there's a new priest, and that's Jesus Christ. Now, here I'm going to read to you about the heavenly sanctuary, which is now in place. Um, it says, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ be through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. 
cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Wait a minute. This is a question. Let me start over. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the external spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, it continues to tell you what all happens. So this is a really, really wonderful part of the Bible. It, ex it, it explains um, how Christ was actually um, how the people knew that he was coming and how it was told in the Old Testament that there would be an, um, a mediator um, a new a new uh, priest let's see let me go back to what we were reading last night and that is, Last night we read the King of Righteousness. We read the need for a new priesthood. Okay? Now, this is the greatness of this new priest. So now that I've told you that Christ is this new mediator, and he actually is the person, the priest, not person, but he is the high priest that we go to and pray to God through. Okay? So years ago... It was this high priest that went into the Holy of Holies, and he spoke for the people. Now Jesus himself speaks for us, right to God, for us. He is our high priest in the heavenly place. So I'm going to tell you about his greatness. It says, and in Inasmuch as he was not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him, it says, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. This is talking about before. So, when they were priests before, because they would die, then they would have to, um, it says, because he could, but they would have to announce somebody else as the priest because one priest couldn't be the priest forever because he would die. But this says, but he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. So he's letting you know that Jesus Christ is the priest forever. He has the power to save those who come to him forever. Because he lives to make an intercession with God. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, who has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the people's, for this he did once for all, when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. But the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints the Son, who has been perfected forever. So it's just such, the whole thing is just unbelievably beautiful. And when you hear the order of it and you hear the fact that God 
gave us this new covenant and he provided Jesus Christ as an ultimate sacrifice. And then you read about how Jesus Christ is our high priest and what he's capable of doing and how he's sitting at the right hand of God. You will read that he is, in fact, God's son, and he was around when the heavens were made, but he chose to do his Father's will, come here, and make this new covenant. It is an amazing, something that's way out of this world, more than we can fathom, more than we can clearly understand in our earthly carnal ways. But spiritually, the only way we can believe in Jesus Christ is through the Holy Spirit, which he sends to us to help us. So, the more you read about it, the better it gets. And there's just tons and tons and tons of information. I could just sit here and read for hours, and it's just beautiful words. Um, and I'll continue to read a little bit about it as we go. I think I've talked enough tonight for y'all to have enough for one evening. Um, if you want to go back and look at what I've read, you can look in. Um, I, I read parts of chapter 7, and I also read parts of chapter 9. Okay, and I didn't even get into chapter 8 because it talks about the priestly service and the covenant. Um, but we'll get there. And then once we're finished with the word, I think I would like to read a little bit in these commentaries to you guys. Because they're really good as, as well. If you want to take a look at the commentaries, you just go to blueletterbible.com. That's B-L-U-E letter L-E-T-T-E-R Bible B-I-B-L-E dot com. And um, you can look at the top, and it has study tools, and you click the study tab, and it has text commentaries. Now, I really like Charles Spurgeon. Now, if you're a new Christian and you're new to studying the Bible, you, you don't really need to jump in and start reading commentaries. The, you, you really just need to read the Word of God and let the Holy Spirit guide you as it sees fit. You do not have to be uh, dependent on a commentary or a person to teach you uh, what is in the Bible. You just need to pick it up and read it, okay? Because the Holy Spirit, if you're saved, is going to help you discern right from wrong and good from evil. And you'll be able to do that. That's why he gives us the Holy Spirit. So I do not recommend that you go in and start reading commentaries and all this other information if you haven't, in fact, read the Word of God, I think you should read the Word of God at least one time through before you start searching and trying to study. Um, just because if you don't learn anything but, I remember the first time I ever read the Bible through, if you don't learn anything but, oh my heavens, this book is spiritually written. And you will learn that as you read it. And you continue to read it. Now, when I read it, I read it front to back. And some people don't recommend that, but I did that. And the longer I read it, the more I understood that there was no way on, on this God's great earth that men could put this together by themselves and make it in such harmony and realistic as it really, you know, as it is. I mean, there's just no way. And you're not going to know that. For one, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Lord. You're not going to have the faith that it takes to really know that the Bible is a living thing unless you read it first. I'm hoarse tonight. I don't know why. Um, ever since I went through um, radiation, I have been hoarse because I had lymph nodes in my neck that were positive. As well as under my arms. So when they did the radiation, they went, you know, all the way across. And um, it drives me crazy because I know I sound so hoarse and I sound like, you know, I've been smoking a 10 packs of cigarettes and never smoked cigarettes. But it's just my voice now. And it's so different. My kids had the hardest time when they were little 
getting used to it because I used to sing and I would sing to them and it sounded so pretty because they were just in like the third and fourth grade and I would sing to them at night and then I just don't, they didn't want me to sing it at all anymore and I think it's because it is so different than it used to be. Um, it probably scared them. <laughs> it doesn't scare y'all because that's what y'all know me as. This is how I sound. I was embarrassed when I was on TV when I would talk. I, I just don't like it that much. But I shouldn't be embarrassed. I should be thankful that God has me here and that he has um, me here for a reason. And I should be thankful that I'm letting him use me as a vessel as well and not worry about my throat. But it does bother me a little bit. Um, and yes, it's not just reflux because I actually take something for that. And it, that's not what it is. I don't have any reflux lately at all, but it's just messed up. Um, but I didn't even read the study from today because I've been in depth in Hebrew. Um, but the study of the day was he is enough. God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. It says, Jesus, I need you. You know how deep my hurt goes, but I know you are enough and will love me through it. Amen. Oh my goodness. My throat is dry. Um, I guess we'll say our prayers, and it's so good to have all of y'all on here. It's very encouraging for me um, and us as a group to have each other and know that we have each other at night to see and talk to before we go to bed. Um, I hope y'all have a blessed day tomorrow. I'm going to go ahead, and we're going to say our prayers, and I thank y'all for tuning in, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for today, and we thank you um, for your word and for your son and for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And may we not be so um, self-centered to think about things just like me worrying about my voice or the way we look or the way we, um, the personality traits you have given us, Lord. What May we accept those and love each other no matter what love each other unconditionally because you love us that way. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would um, love you more. And because we love you more, we'll love other people more. Um, just be with us as we go throughout our day. Be with our children and our families and our friends and our church families. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a good night. And... Um, I'm trying to think. I believe it was Linda that had surgery today. I need to send her an instant message because I'm pretty sure it was today and not tomorrow. Anyway, I'll no, it's Lee. I believe it was Lee Taylor, I think. Um, anyway, I'm going to go in and check on her. But y'all have a good night. But my pastor is doing well. He came through the surgery. It was a little bit longer than they expected. But he's um, doing pretty good, you know, and um, they think he might get to come home in two or three days. So uh, thanks for praying for Pastor Jack. We will talk to y'all later. Love you. Bye.